Now, the coronavirus pandemic has brought with it an overwhelming raft of information. And with the science changing so fast, it is fertile ground for conspiracy theories. Our next guest calls it a perfect storm, a global crisis trapped between the medical and political worlds. Dr. F. Perry Wilson is a world-renowned clinical researcher at Yale University and is documenting his life as he works now on a COVID-19 ward. Here's our Hari Srinivasan talking to him about his experience and the danger of misinformation. Thanks, Christian. Dr. Wilson, I want to ask, and in this conversation, perhaps I should start with maybe my own errors because we're all making them. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I sent out a tweet and it read, the coronavirus mutated and appears to be more contagious now. New study finds. I'm a journalist. I think I know how to vet a good source. And then, I don't know, maybe 24 hours less later, I'm also tweeting, beware overblown claims of dangerous coronavirus strains, <laughs> lineages versus strains and mutations, because that article went through and basically debunked the study that the first article was based on. And if I am falling for this, how can everyone else who's looking for information about coronavirus get smarter when they see medical research quoted in popular literature? This is a huge challenge right now. The coronavirus pandemic is more or less a perfect storm to have medical information, misinformation be propagated. Um, you've got data coming out faster than we've ever seen before for any disease. You know, it's just a huge rush to publish. You have a very high level of public interest for obvious reasons. So a lot of these are going to get written about. And then you have, of course, a social media environment, which is more complex and has more power to disseminate information, whether good or bad, than ever before. So we are really seeing um, what can go what can go wrong in sort of turned up to 11 here in this pandemic. And this um, this study can teach us a number of important things. Um, so just for a little bit of background for your viewers, this was a study that came out of a very well-respected vi virology genetics group, which looked and found that a certain mutation in the virus, and viruses mutate all the time, but a particular mutation had become very common, particularly in Europe and the United States. That's data. Um, and there's no reason that we have to think that that data is incorrect. But of course, it's the interpretation of the data where people often run into trouble. That paper interpreted that observation as saying, this mutation must be easier to transmit because it's spreading, it's spreading faster. Um, that paper was actually a preprint. It hadn't undergone peer review yet. And one of the key things that peer review does is it takes that data and that paper and it sends it to a group of independent researchers with expertise in that area. And their job is not just to critique it or pick it apart, but oftentimes to add other hypotheses to say, we're looking at your data and there's another way to interpret this. So this was before peer review and the paper said what you, are, what you tweeted about, that this mutation seems to be dominant. It's probably more transmissible. What people, realized after the fact is that there's another explanation here, which is that when you have a new virus that is seeing a totally uh, population that's completely susceptible to it, that luck of the draw, which viral little mutation happens to get to, let's say, New York City first, is going to disseminate very rapidly because it's like a spark you know, landing in a dry brush bed. It's, there's nothing special about that particular spark. It just happened to be the one that hit the dry brush bed. And so that's also an interpretation of the data. One of the things we talk about in my online course on interpreting medical studies is that we always have to be cognizant that data can often be interpreted in multiple ways. And we have to be sort of careful about our own biases in terms of looking for those other possibilities. What went wrong when it comes to hydroxychloroquine? It was part of a national conversation very fast. We added a lot of it to our stockpile. You're a doctor, you were working uh, on a COVID positive ward recently and you kept a diary of it. What was different from the process of reviewing something versus where we went with it with our, really, with our optimism? So one of the biases that all humans have, um, and we all engage in this, me too, is, uh, is motivated reasoning. 
which is that we have an outcome we want and we sort of look for data to support that outcome. Um, when the better way to do it is to look at the data first and draw logical conclusions from there. Hydroxychloroquine early on um, sort of filled this niche for people. It was a drug we had experience with. Most people tolerate it quite well. And some of the uh, studies in the lab using you know, cells in Petri dishes and stuff seem to suggest, yeah, this might have an effect on the virus. You then had some very charismatic scientists who were touting their results quite a bit. Um, but some of those studies were quite flawed. So the, the most famous one was the study um, in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. This was a study directly referenced by President Trump in a tweet um, from a, a French uh, group that had treated 20 patients with hydroxychloroquine and 16 without. Now, not randomized. They didn't flip a coin to see who got the treatment, which would be the best possible design. But nevertheless, they report on these 36 people and said that in the 20 that got treated with hydroxychloroquine, the viral load decreased more quickly. Very promising. But if you read the paper, what you found was that they excluded six people who got hydroxychloroquine from their analysis. Four of those people died. Um, one of the persons stopped the hydroxychloroquine because of side effects, and one was discharged from the hospital. Now, if you exclude people who die from one arm of a study, and you don't do that from another arm of the study, and no one was excluded from the control arm of this study, well, the arm that doesn't have any deaths in it because you kicked them out of that arm is going to look better. So that's a, that's a real flaw that didn't get picked up on, and yet, nevertheless, you know, this spread like wildfire because we all want it to be true. We want that drug to work or any drug to work. And so as scientists and as people who are consuming science, we have to be so careful to realize that just because we want something to be true doesn't mean we can only look at data that supports our beliefs. I want to get back to the, the time that you spent when you were chronicling your video diary. What are you seeing when you s treat these patients? What I'm seeing is a, an incredible spectrum of disease. Now, all these patients are in the hospital, so they're sick enough you know, these are sick people, they need oxygen, um, they have fevers, they're very uncomfortable, there's a lot of muscle aches and things. But um, unlike when it's flu season and, and, and things like that, where unless the patients are kind of very sick to begin with, with lots of medical issues, you know, everyone kind of does okay. Um, here we're seeing even quite healthy people with incredibly severe disease. And it's that spread between, you know, a person who is basically just lying in bed, has a little oxygen in their nose, to in the intensive care unit, on dialysis, on a ventilator machine. And, and you look at the patients and they seem similar, you know, the same age. It, it, it's very disconcerting, um, particularly for healthcare providers, because we see young, healthy patients getting incredibly sick. And in the back of our heads, as we're caring for these people, is like, okay, I'm in this environment there's a decent chance I will catch this at some point. You know, we're all being careful, but we know that healthcare workers are at higher risk. Am I gonna get the sniffles and maybe need some oxygen or am I gonna end up in the intensive care unit? Um, and even, you know, for me, I'm, I'm young, thankfully I'm, I'm healthy, I don't have any medical issues. I've seen people like me who have done very badly and even some who have died, now that is, I want to say, a small, small percentage. The chances are, if I get sick, I'll be fine. The chances are, if most of us get sick, we'll be fine. But it is true that we're seeing in some people, and we're not entirely sure what the risk factor is, just a kind of catastrophic illness. And that, um, that does keep us up at night a bit. We have a certain impatience, and that means myself included in the news cycle, uh, that we will write a headline or that we will look at a study in kind of the initial stages, especially at a time like this where we're looking for new bits of information and nobody necessarily thinks about the fact that it could take several months to review a study, to replicate it. And that's kind of not the environment that we're waiting on because everyone wants to figure out when can I make a decision for my life based on, even if I'm thinking good science, based on science. I don't think it's reasonable to say, okay, no one report on any studies until, you know, they've been thoroughly peer reviewed and replicated and vetted because you're right, it's just gonna take too much time. But what we do have to do is tell our readers and our viewers um, the number one rule I have um, for interpreting a medical study, which is that no single study is definitive. You know, you can read something carefully and, and you can use rationality to figure this out, but even if you don't, you will be safe 
if you wait for the replication study, the second study to come from a different group. And yet, because of the news cycle, because of how shareable certain headlines can be, we have this vision of science as like a big, game-changing, groundbreaking study. And the truth is that there are very, very, very few of those. Um, and really, science is kind of a slow, plodding process. And even as we report on those studies, we need to remind people that we're taking step by step by step towards the truth. One of the things that people are thinking about right now is how good are the tests, both on the diagnostic level, if I was to get a swab inserted into my nose or any other form of it, and then also on the antibody testing, yeah. right? It, how do I know that these are reliable if they're not FDA reviewed? Mm. There are several that have an emergency use authorization at this point. I mean, who's going to help us make sense of that, especially when it comes time to make those decisions on what sorts of lifestyle changes we're going to make, on whether we're going to go into office spaces, get into public transit, and so forth? These tests are quite difficult to interpret, actually. Um, you may find that uh, you know if you went and got an antibody test that it comes back positive. And what does that mean for you? Well, the, the thing that often surprises people is even if the test only has, let's say, a 5% false positive rate, so that might get reported. It'll say, okay, you know, um, out of 100 people who never had coronavirus, five will test positive. You think, oh, that's pretty good. If you test positive, you'll feel like, oh, great. You know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm pretty good shape. I probably had it. I'm probably safe. I can go back to work. Well, that's not exactly right. And the reason it's not right is because there are more people who haven't had coronavirus than who have. So just to imagine, if you had 1,000 people who never had coronavirus and 100 who did, and you did antibody testing, and let's say all those 100 you captured, positive, great. 5% of that 1,000 is another 50 people that you're gonna test positive. So now if you add that together, you've got 150 people who tested positive and actually 50 of them never had it. They are the false positive. So people say, wait, but there's supposed to be a 5% false positive rate, but now you're telling me that based on how many people had been exposed in the population, maybe my chance is only two thirds that I really had in the past. That's scary. And I would appreciate a viewer sort of, you know, wrinkling their brain, listening to that, thinking, how does that all work? We're gonna to have to be really careful, not just about the quality of the test, but about the interpretation of the test. And so um, I'm looking to public officials to be actually quite cautious about what they tell us when it comes to interpreting positive antibody tests. My personal opinion is that we won't be issuing any um, COVID passports or antibody-based passports anytime soon because of that very problem. Regarding testing right now, there's a sort of storyline that reveals that Folks in the White House have been testing positive for coronavirus, but what's more intriguing to me is the level of testing and access to testing that they have, meaning people who are closer and closer to the president are tested almost to a daily basis, and people who are further away are getting tests perhaps every week. How frequently will we be testing to make sure that our whatever community is, whether it's a work community, a church community, a school community, is safe to be interacting. I, I, I think in terms of what's happening around the president, which are uh, what are known as the PCR tests, so that shows active live virus. Um, this is not feasible on a national scale. Uh, there's, there's no sign that we're anywhere close to having that number of tests available or the bandwidth to process them. Um, so would it be nice? Maybe, but it's not gonna happen. Now, antibody testing is a different story because once presumably you confirm your antibody positive and assuming it's a true positive, um, then you are positive forevermore. So you don't need to do that repeat testing. We don't have the capacity to antibody test everyone either, but, um, but we can be very uh, precise about doing what are called seroprevalence surveys, which means you go into a community where there's transmission of coronavirus and epidemiologists and scientists randomly sample people in a very careful way, you know, certain neighborhoods and certain age groups. You don't necessarily test every single person, but you test representative samples from a bunch of different groups to kind of create a map of how the disease is spreading throughout a community. I think that's our best way forward in terms of understanding the sort of undercurrent of what's happening with this disease. Because what we're seeing, you know, are people in the hospital, we know there's transmission 
outside of the hospital. We know there are people with mild disease, but we really have no idea if that's 50% of all the cases or like 95% of all the cases at this point. Where do you rank the White House in the quality of information in the medical context that's coming out of it? Because it seems that by not wearing masks while you're having meetings, even though the CDC and public health experts say that you should, social distance, is sending mixed messages here? I'm quite concerned about this. Uh, a lot of focus on the administration's response has revolved around testing, and it, it, is, it is clear that a robust testing protocol is needed to reopen society. Um, but there's something else that's going on here. Americans don't like being told what to do. <laughs> We're an independent people. Um, and so rules and regulations and wear a mask and, and stand six feet apart, there is a tendency, I think, for people to say, you know what, no, you know, you can't tell me what to do. Individual liberty is paramount. But there have been times in history where Americans uh, uh, have embraced a shared sacrifice. And an important part of reopening safely is lifestyle change on, on all of our parts. Doors are gonna open, stores are gonna reopen. We can't keep things closed forever. All we have to do to really cut down on transmission is to behave in really simple, appropriate ways, to wear that mask, to wash your hands, to do the social distancing, to keep large gatherings from agglomerating too many people together. And you don't have to tell people or order people to do this. I don't think they respond as well to that. What you need to do is demonstrate it. You need to say it is patriotic to wear a mask. It is patriotic to give space to your neighbors. We need to work together as Americans right now to save our country from this disease. And I wish the government would do a bit of a better job of modeling that behavior, not because they are being told to by the CDC who are scientists and have you know good data to support it, but in this case, because it's the patriotic thing to do and it's the right thing to do because when bad things are happening, Americans come together to support each other. They don't become fiercely independent survivalists. Dr. Perry Wilson, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, my pleasure.